Hi, Margie Ann Bonnet, and I'm here for the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. Today is going to be an engaging evening and day supporting women's causes. Top of the morning to you. celebrating the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. I'm here with Kathy Wilmot, who's going to talk a little bit about what inspired her to come to this event and support this wonderful cause. Kathy. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, well, I got involved with this association here um, because I'm actually involved with Women in ABC. And Women in ABC encourages young women to, and women also re-entering the workforce, into looking at construction as a career. And when I found out about the Maryland Women's Heritage Center, it looked like a great opportunity where we would not only be able to talk about the um, uh, women who have been in construction in the Baltimore and actually the Maryland area, but also um, maybe having opportunities for seminars and um, things Hello. to do that can help teach women about that type of career. That's absolutely fascinating, Kathy. What is your profession that you are interested in construction and other types of business-related activities? Well, my husband and I own Wilmot Modular Structures, so we uh, provide office trailers uh, and storage containers to contractors, and I got involved with Associated Builders and Contractors. I'm their chair this year, and uh, this is just something that I just developed a passion for over the years. Wonderful. Thank you so much for supporting this event. I'm a former Miss Preakness from 1989 and I run a company called Sandler Training Institute. I like to work with women and support women's causes to empower them to be powerful business leaders. And we're here with Rebecca today. Rebecca, tell us what brought you to this event and what you do. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Hofberger and I'm the director, founder and toilet scrubber at the American Visionary Art Museum. And this year I was inducted into the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. And uh, so 
the privilege to be here with women I admire a lot more than I admire myself is what brought me here today. And it's so funny that we're looking out over the famous historic Pimlico racetrack because women have been getting the run around for a lot of years, right? But uh, with this commission and with the Heritage Hall of Fame and with the eventual museum, the Heritage Center, I think it's a it signals something mighty fine and not being so much to run around anymore. So uh, it's it's a very fitting place, a very fun place. Women of all ages are here and backgrounds, and it's a privilege to be among them. Rebecca, thank you so much for coming. And Rebecca, tell us a little bit more about your hat. Oh, <laughs> no, my good hat, I, I donated one called Foxy Lady in tribute to Jimi Hendrix, of course. And it has um, a Maryland, uh, uh, you know, the um, state flower of Maryland on it. It's an Italian base straw hat uh, with like tracks of black and beige uh, uh, straw. But then I have two horses running around the band with a fox. <laughs> so we call it Foxy Lady. And hopefully it'll help raise some money for a very worthy cause here. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. We are really excited to be here. Our first fundraising event at Pimlico. Hats off to women where we're honoring all the many hats that women wear. We're here in the historic Jockey Club. Everybody looks fabulous. And this is a kickoff. Hopefully you'll be coming back for Preakness with your hats too. So you'll get at least two days wear out of them. For lots of reasons, but this is such a great project, and I'm so excited about it. And it really started with um, it just it, it really started at a women's commission meeting that I went to and was invited to soon after Bob got elected. And there's some women there that are really committed and have been committed for years, 20 years, some of them, to women in Maryland and celebrating and do the, doing the Women's Heritage Trail, which is so great. But the time has really come for us to have our own museum and our own place. And I really believe that. And it is really at the impetus of a lot of other people that this has really gotten started. One is Francie Glendening. You're going to hear from her. But she and I have a wonderful relationship. You know, we've both been both parties. I was a Democrat, now a Republican. She was a Republican, now a Democrat. So we cover it all. And uh, we, uh, in a very nonpartisan way, come together on a terrific project. Linda Shevitz, who is really terrific, has been dedicated to this cause forever. Linda, stand up a minute. This event today, she and Jill Moss Greenberg, who I've not seen yet today, is Jill here? She is, she is not here with us today, but uh, Linda and Jill have really done an amazing job with the project. I'm sure Mark and Susan Schaefer are here. I've not seen them. Ellie is here. Uh, and uh, Shoshana Carden has also committed to help us raising money. She's a legend in Maryland and a legend for women and a Hall of Fame. Shoshana, thank you. We can't thank you enough for your commitment to this project. And uh, several other people in this room that uh, Michelle Duffy Orr, who is our treasurer of our nonprofit, we are organized to have our nonprofit, and we are very proud under the efforts of Jill Moss Greenberg and Linda and several others that uh, were able to save our money this year, $250,000 seed money from the governor's budget, and uh, we're thrilled to have that. So it looks like we are underway with this great event today and hopefully many others. Uh, it is a wonderful mission, this organization. Our mission is to preserve the past, understand the present, and shape the future by recognizing, respecting, and transmitting the experiences and contributions of Maryland women of diverse culture and geographic backgrounds. Educating school children throughout the state is an important role of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. And again, I think we have the best superintendent in the United States, Nancy, Dr. Nancy Grasnick. She's here, you will hear from her, and I will tell you that she's an integral part of this museum and this effort, because without the education component, it just doesn't cut the mustard. So it's really important, but particularly for the legacy of our young women, to learn and teach the contributions of Maryland women throughout the state. And I think that is important. 
The center is envisioned as a museum, learning, and resource center. Archives showcase for Maryland women in the arts and a place for gathering to discuss important issues like health and other important issues throughout our state that affect our women. And we have such great history. That's another point of this. We're just so uh, privileged to have so many women that have accomplished so much. Maryland women, just to cite a few, have developed COBOL computer language, led the Underground Railroad, bringing hundreds from slavery to freedom, served as a military advisor to President Lincoln, founded the American Red Cross, published the first printed copy of the Declaration of Independence. And it's just, just to name a few, Francie's going to talk a little bit about those that have been mentioned in her book and how important that book is to our history. So uh, because of all that, I think this is just a great project. We are um, going to make this a reality. We uh, believe that we will utilize our seed money to really have a project uh, profile and timeline ready for all of us. So I can't thank you enough today for coming out and supporting this effort. I also just want to mention that uh, a couple of thank yous. Linda Busick, our event chair today, spent just tons of time to make this fundraiser a success. Linda made the centerpieces one at a time and personally designate, designed each invitation as well. Ellie Elton, who I mentioned before, also uh, in this project from the beginning, has worked in the program and coordinated the silent auction, which is always a, a difficult job. Gloria Sembrani, who is part of this uh, wonderful institution here at Pimlico, I've worked with her before. Thank you for helping on this event. And uh, Betsy Dugan from Octavia. Also Loretta uh, Gubernatis from the Baltimore Access Cable for doing the videotaping. Thank you. And I hope I got that right. Is that pronounced right? Gubernatis. Gubernatis, thank you. Like gubernatorial. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> like gubernatorial, I got it. And all uh, the talented artists and supportive businesses for coming out here today. It really is a wonderful project. I have to tell you that we've done a lot and it's been a long time. Sometimes, as you know, when you do a startup uh, project like this, it is two steps forward and ten steps backwards, and we've certainly been through those trials and tribulations. I see Linda nodding and shaking her head. Uh, so, and many of you have been supportive along the way. We're going to ask you to do more as we get uh, things up and running, but this is a great core group to get this started. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Doug Duncan and his wife being here supporting that. Uh, um, uh, County Executive Jack Johnson being here. Jack Johnson is here. Thank you very much for supporting the effort. And all those other elected officials that have been so supportive along the way. I really, really appreciate it. The time has come for Maryland to celebrate the women's history with our own space and our own place. And I really appreciate all of you being here. Thank you very much. And we're here with Shoshana. Shoshana, what brings you here with this lovely hat that you're wearing? Oh, thank you. I'm here to help celebrate the beginning of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. This is one of our kickoff events. Uh, Maryland has a history of remarkable women in all phases of life and throughout, well, actually the centuries. And we want to celebrate that with a heritage center so people will know how great our heritage is and encourage young women to achieve to the best of their ability. Shoshana, what inspired you to become part of this organization? Well, I think that we don't have enough knowledge about the wonderful, remarkable women who came before us and helped make this a great state. And this is one way of sharing that information with the young women and let them know that they're, they're lucky to be living in a state as open and as great and as informing as Maryland is for women. Thank you so much for participating. Let's have a look at your beautiful hat. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this hat is an old hat. I used to come to the Preakness years ago, and I did wear this hat to Preakness races. So it was fun digging it out of the closet so I could wear it today. You've heard a lot about leadership and about remarkable Maryland women, and we certainly couldn't be here pre-Preakness and here at Pimlico without recognizing the role that women have played in racing. Certainly Maryland has a rich history, has a rich history of African American contributions also to Maryland racing and here at Pimlico. But I would like to ask Andrea Seafeld Knight to come up. Okay. Andrea 
who was a graduate of South River High School in Anne Arundel County, began showing horses at a very early age, won a number of blue ribbons, and in order to make some money to continue showing horses. She got a job at the racetrack as a hot walker, a groom, and an exercise rider. Eventually, in 1981, riding in her first race at the age of 18, and I understand you won your first race within the next couple of months. By 1990, she was named the leading female jockey in the nation in earnings, and she was one of the first three female jockeys to ride in the Kentucky Derby, and one of only two women ever to ride in the Creekness. In uh, 1992, she won the award as the uh, Maryland Jockey of the Year, and she has also been inducted into the Anne Arundel County Women's, uh, not Women's, Anne Arundel County Sports Hall of Fame. Over her career, she now uh, raises horses and trains them and is not riding anymore. Over her career, she rode over 6,000 miles, and the purses for the races she was in totaled over $8 million. Uh, just as uh, an anecdote, when she was 13, I was talking to another woman, Liz Smith, who was a trainer and a, um, a horse of uh, trainer of horses now, said she went, at the age when Andrea was 13, she went to a track to try to get a license as an exercise rider and was told, go home to your mommy and get a permission slip to be here. And it took her several years to get a, a license as an exercise trainer. So we now see the progress we've made when we have somebody like Andrea. I'd just like to ask Andrea two short questions. One, what barriers you had to overcome as a woman? And then what it felt like to ride in the Kentucky Derby in the Preakness? Thank you all. I'm very honored I'm not the speaker, but the people who are in front of me, um, I ride horses. <laughs> Uh, the barriers I overcame were um, yeah, seemed un insurmountable at times. Uh, the stereotypes of the jockeys are supposed to be male and strong and short, and I was a good six inches taller, at least, foot to six, two feet taller than a lot of them. <laughs> um, the um, jockey's room, I was the only female on most days, and it was in being in a locker room with men all day long. It was quite different than being up here with a lot of ladies, <laughs> I'll say. Um, the barriers, I just had to convince people that I could ride horses, that the strength really did not come into it. I was able to use my brain. I got along with horses, and I was able to outsmart a lot of the jockeys that I rode with, and um, eventually I ended up riding better horses, and then it did uh, just the horses take care of you. If you ride a good horse, you have a much better chance. And then um, to ride in Kentucky Derby was just the most awesome thing that ever happened to me. And um, there was just electricity in the air, and to be there included with those other jockeys, male or female, just to be there was an experience. And then to follow up and riding here in the Pimlico Special and the Preakness were um, the biggest days of my career. Thank you all. We'd like to present Andrew with a gift. And a certificate hats off to women. Greatness is not found in possessions, power, or prestige. It is discovered in goodness, humanity, service, and character. Hi, this is Margie Ann Bonnet for the Maryland Women's Heritage Festival and Museum. We're here celebrating an exciting event where women are coming together to gather for a common cause. It's very heavy, and it's now coming off. <laughs> to be here this afternoon with our First Lady and our former First Lady and all of the people who've gathered here and have been recognized so eloquently by Kendall Ehrlich. I'd like to say that this really began 25 years ago when there was a joint effort by the Women's Commission and the, and the Maryland State Department of Education developing a women's history project. And 25 years later, I recall taking Kendall Ehrlicher being with her as she spoke with the Women's Commission. And they talked about the importance of women's history and that actually 50% of our population is female in the state of Maryland. 
And yet there's no place, single place, where we honor women and their contributions past and present. And she said, I'm going to tackle this. And we're going to make this happen. And so there's so many people who've come together to make this happen. And I am feeling personal pride and basking in the reflected glory of Linda Shevitz today. Because Linda is a member of the State Department of Education and has done a fabulous job, not only today, but throughout the um, advent of this idea. So Linda, take another bow. museum would not be substantive, would not be an enduring opportunity for our students especially. But this will be the only state project of its kind and in the entire nation which will provide educational materials to all public schools and libraries um, throughout the state of Maryland and it will be done on an annual basis. So as our students come to the museum, they will be prepared for what they're observing. As they leave, they can reflect on that and really integrate that level of learning. And so aren't we lucky to have Shoshana Carden as someone who stepped up and said she'd be willing to take on this responsibility as chairing the effort for fundraising. So Shoshana, wherever you are, thank you so much. But as one looks out at this audience, you see the talent and beauty of women. And that's what this museum will represent not only for the famous, but for those unsung heroines who have done so much for us in the state of Maryland. So I'm thrilled to be here and thank all of you who made it possible. And from the educational perspective, I am dedicated to making this a reality. Thank you. I'm here with Frances, who's going to tell us how she's enjoying the event and what inspired her to be here today. I think it's terribly exciting that they're starting this, this project and I want to help them raise money, so I gave uh, a glass sculpture to uh, auction off and uh, I hope that it will help and I'm enjoying a beautiful day and lots of fun people. Frances, are you an artist? I am. I'm a glass sculptor and I make glass jewelry and plates. Uh, here in Baltimore. I just set up a big studio. What inspired you to become an artist? Well, um, in middle age, I decided that it was what I wanted to do most in life. I moved to Baltimore. I went to the Institute. I graduated in 97 in painting, and the rest is history. Well, hats off to you, and thank you for supporting such a wonderful event. department and I come from a long line of racing and I'm here to show you the day. My father is a retired rider. So he retired in 68. So when I grew up they didn't have year-round racing in Maryland as we do now. So we moved all over the country. So I've lived in just about every state that has a racetrack. So it was very interesting and I thought that that was how people lived. I really did. And I didn't realize that that's not the case. When I did not know the pleasure. I'm very tiny. I was the kind of little girl that went to the track with my mother and I dressed up every day. You know, and you came out and that, that was your life. You know, you came out and you played with the jockey, the work of the jockey. And I never feel like I'm a regular woman. Um, she Yes, yes, that was, that was, that 
was you. I was going to say the ones with a bad reputation, but I didn't say that. Okay? Yeah, because we like to be around the horses. Yeah, I love them too. I saw all the injuries, though, that jockeys receive and the problems they have with weight control. And luckily, my father happens to be one of the few riders that are, that's very naturally small. He still is sick, which is very easy to maintain. The average weight is about 109 pounds. If you're a bug rider, which is a new rider, they have to start out at about 104 pounds because they get a 10-pound allowance from the journeymen, which are experienced riders. So these valets, they help saddle up the horses for the owner, and they make sure all the tacking gear is set up for the jockey and his race because each race the jockey has to weigh One race he might weigh 122, the next race 116, the following race 118. And you wonder, well, how do they do that? You can't lose and gain it. It's all done with the equipment. They have different size saddles. They even have different size boots. Some boots have heels in them. They weigh more. Some boots are just flat. And when they get on the scale and it says that they have to weigh 116 when they get up there, that's all their tacking gear, that's everything, so you know that these men are under this. There's no height restriction on being a jockey, it's the weight restriction. The taller you are, the harder it is to maintain the weight. My father didn't have a big problem because he's naturally small. And most of these guys were all athletic and small. Welcome back everyone, welcome. I can't talk about it. Again, there we go.